Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it is, by my estimation, September 14th. Given that yesterday was the 13th, it seems like they uh, fall into place that way, don't they? Mm -hmm. so, you know, so as we're as we're reading today, one of the things that I, I was uh, looking at uh, some commentaries this morning because uh, I had a little extra time, and uh, one of the things that uh, the one of the commentaries I was reading had had put out as a hypothesis, and it. And it's certainly a hypothesis. I mean, there's no there's no evidential reason for us to believe it, but uh, it does seem incredibly likely that these friends that are bringing accusations may have been uh, conspiring or discussing, you know, Job's life by themselves. I mean, I don't know if you've ever had a, a friend that you were concerned about, and you maybe got a couple of your other buddies together and said, "We got to talk about. We got to talk about." this friend of ours, I mean, it seems like he's gone off the rails because their <laughs> accusations are, are, are getting stronger and they're getting uh, very specific. And they're specific in a way that isn't actually true, but they're presented as if they were true. And, uh, and so the commentary's concept was that that is an, often an indicator of, of a shared belief that was emboldened by others. And, uh, and I thought about that a lot uh, this morning. And I'm like, you know, I, I, we don't know for sure if that, if that was true of Job's friends, but we could take that, I think, as a church, as a real warning about how it is that we conduct our conversation about somebody when they're not present. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that is always a slippery slope. It's always dangerous. It's always condemned in scripture. It is, uh, it is vile. It is, uh, you know, that notion of gossip is, I think, one of the most significant sins in all of scripture. It causes more damage relationally than anything I've, I've seen happen. I, I, would, I would put gossip or area of sin as an affair. I mean, it's like, it betrays, it injures, it damages in so significant fashion that, uh, you know, I wonder. So as you read, as we read today together, you know, have that in the back of your mind. Like, I wonder if some of these friends were talking about this and maybe that was what emboldened them uh, to have such strong accusations against Job. And one of the, the other elements of this that is so intriguing to me is, again, if you remember chapters one and two, if you were with us at the beginning, if you remember chapters one and two, it was God who declares Job righteous. We'll see him at the very end come back around and God will again affirm that even in his speech, even in his conduct through all of this, he remained righteous. And so we have outside perspective from God of how he sees this situation and how he sees God or Job as, as having done what was required and expected of him in a way that was a blessing to God himself. And so uh, when, we, when we have that as, a, as both a forethought and then a backdrop, we can rest in the assurance of its correctness in light of these accusations. So... Mm -hmm. Chapter 22, then Eliphaz, the Telemite, replied, can a man be of benefit to God? Can even a wise person benefit him? What pleasure would it give the Almighty if you were righteous? So in other words, he's coming out of the gate saying, you know what, uh, Job, we know that, that God only is uh, correcting in this way the unrighteous. What, what pleasure would it give God to be bringing this kind of correction into your life if you were, in fact, righteous? You're, you're claiming you're righteous, but we know that God doesn't, doesn't act in this way towards somebody who is righteous. And so your claim for righteousness cannot be right. That cannot be true. And not only that, uh, we've got some ideas of why that might, why that might not be true. I mean, what would he gain if your ways were blameless and this was happening? It, it, is it for your piety that he rebukes you and brings charges against you? Or is it, you know, your arrogance? Or is it not your wickedness? Isn't it great 
uh, are not your sins endless? You demand se security from your relatives for no reason? In other words, I've got four charges. You're, you're arrogant, you're taking, up, uh, you're taking up securities in ways you shouldn't, you've stripped people of their clothing, you're not, you're not generous, you're leaving them naked, you're not even giving them water to the weary. Uh, you and you will withhold not just water, but food from the hungry. You're not caring for the needy. Though you were a powerful man owning land, an honored man living on it, you sent widows away empty handed. You, you didn't have a, a generous heart. You broke the strength of the fatherless. That is why snares are all around you. Why sudden peril terrifies you. Why it is so dark that you cannot see why a flood of water covers you. Is it not God on the heights of heaven? And, and see how lofty are the heights, the highest stars. Yet you say, what does God know? Does he, does he judge through such darkness that clouds veil him? So he does not see us as he goes about the vaulted heavens. Will you keep to the old path that the wicked have trod. They are carried off before their time, their foundations washed away by a flood. They said to God, leave us alone. What can the Almighty do to us? Yet it was he who filled their houses with good things. So I stood aloof uh, from the plans of the wicked. The righteous see their ruin and rejoice. The innocent mock them saying, surely our foes are destroyed and fire devours their wealth. Submit to God and, and be at peace with him. In this way, prosperity will come to you. Accept instruction from his mouth and lay up his words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. If you remove the wickedness far from your tent and assign your nuggets to the dust, your gold of Ophar to the rocks of the ravens, then the Almighty will be your gold and the choicest silver for you. Surely you will find delight in the Almighty and you will lift up your face to God and you will pray to him and he will hear you and you will fulfill your vows that you decide on your on that you decide on will be done uh, and light will shine on your ways when people are brought low and you say lift them up then he will save the downcast he will deliver even the one who is innocent who will be delivered through the cleanliness of your hands, which is great in this passage because, uh, again, it, it, it smacks of truth, right? I mean, all of what he's saying is generally true. Uh, you know, a smoke screen is not, is not an effective accusation if there doesn't have elements of truth in it. And so these are generally things that are true of God. And uh, I'll hand it off to you at this point, Todd. Here's Job's response. Even today my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy in spite of my groaning. If only I knew where to find him, if only I could go to his dwelling. I would state my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would find out what he, I would find out what he would answer me and consider what he would say to me. Would he vigorously oppose me? No, he would not press charges against me. There the upright can establish their innocence before him and there I would be delivered forever from my judge. But if I go to the east, he is not there. If I go to the west, I do not find him. When he is at work in the north, I do not see him. When he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. But he knows the way I, that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. My feet have closely followed his steps. I have kept to his way without turning aside. I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. But he stands alone, and who can oppose him? He does whatever he pleases. He Sorry, carries out his I, 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 I was looking at the chat. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he carries out his decree against me, and many such plans he still has in store. That is why I am terrified before him. When I think of all this, I fear him. God has made my heart faint. The Almighty has terrified me. Yet I am not silenced by the darkness, by the thick darkness that covers my face. Why does the Almighty not set times for judgment? 
Why must those who know him look in vain for such days? There are those who move boundary stones, they pasture flocks they have stolen, they drive away the orphan's donkey and take the widow's ox and pledge. They thrust the needy from the path and force all the poor of the land into hiding. Like wild donkeys in the desert, the poor go about their labor of foraging food. The wasteland provides food for their children. They gather fodder in the fields and glean in the vineyards of the wicked. Lacking clothes, they spend the night naked. They have nothing to cover themselves in the cold. They are drenched by mountain rains and hug the rocks for lack of shelter. The fatherless child is snatched from the breast. I lost count, do I have one more? Yep. The infant of the poor is seized for a debt. Lacking clothes, they go about naked. They carry the sheaves, but still go hungry. They crush olives among the terraces. They tread the wine presses, yet suffer thirst. The groans of the dying rise from the city, and the souls of the wounded cry out for help. But God charges no one with wrongdoing. There are those who rebel against the light, who do not know its ways or stay in its paths. When daylight is gone, the murderer rises up, kills the poor and needy, and in the night steals forth like a thief. The eye of the adulterer watches for dusk. He thinks, no eye will see me, and he keeps his face concealed. In the dark, thieves break into houses, but by day they shut themselves in. They want nothing to do with the light. For all of them, midnight is their morning. They make friends with the terrors of darkness. Yet they are foam on the Yet surface of the water. Yet they are foam on the surface of the water. Their portion of the land is cursed, so no one goes to the vineyards. You're frozen there. There you go. Okay. As heat and drought snatch away the melted snow, so the grave snatches away those who have sinned. The womb forgets them. The worm feasts, feast on them. The wicked are no longer remembered, but are broken, tr broken like a tree. They prey on the barren and childless woman, and to the widow they show no kindness. But God drags away the mighty by his power. Though they become established, they have no assurance of life. He may, he may let them rest in a feeling of security, but his eyes are on their ways. For a little while they are exalted, and then they are gone. They are brought low and gathered up like others. They are cut off like heads of grain. If this is not so, who can prove, prove me false and reduce my words to nothing? Well, it looks as though we got carried away, Todd. I don't know. Maybe you read too much, or I did, but we robbed Tanya. Oh, no, you know, we're good. That's all right. Better. We'll just let her answer all the questions. All right. <laughs> well, as a way of getting started before we dive into <clears throat> the questions, will you just do a quick introduction? A lot of people know you. You've read before with us and uh, been part of this, but tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do here at the Journey North. Well, I am Tanya Brucewitz. I've been coming into Journey North for probably more than five years now. Um, I volunteer on the worship team. Absolutely love getting to do that. I get to express my gifts that um, I've hidden for a very long time. Felt a little bit self-conscious about singing because I was always told that I wasn't really good, but um, God really opened and stretched that. And he actually enabled me to soar a lot more with how Josh helps me to use this gift. So I really, I can't even express enough how God has used Josh to do that and that I'm appreciative for. So um, yeah, so I get to do that. And yeah, I love talking so, but I won't do very much of that now. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, any observations about the text you guys before we dive into a few of these questions? <laughs> well. Well, I'm glad I don't have friends like that. <laughs> so I'll just say that. <laughs> I'm very picky about my friends. Um, I always have been since I was a kid. And my mother always said, choose your friends wisely. And as an, an adult, I really haven't had too many issues with friends that do that. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, it's, it's funny because it's like, I look and it's like, uh, I have mixed feelings about these friends. I have mixed <laughs> feelings. I mean, on the one hand, it's like, uh, uh, it's like I kind of aspire to have friends that are courageous enough that they'll 
speak into my life when they see me go off course. Mm -hmm. and, and I, I don't, I don't sense that these friends are malicious. They're just wrong. <laughs> and, uh, and I have surrounded myself with guys, a lot of guys that are, are really, really good, genuinely good guys that'll speak truth, really hard truth into my life. But sometimes they're about as dumb as a bag of rocks, some of these guys. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and so sometimes, sometimes they're wrong. And, uh, and so, <laughs> You know, I, so I've got mixed feelings that uh, this, uh, you know, you know, they're not malicious. I don't like malicious. I don't like the malicious, but I do want people that will that will call, you know, call it, uh, as they see it. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and I've never been someone who surrounds myself with people that are, are necessarily weaker leaders or like that. I mean, I, I'd like to have the Tim Lakes and the Todd Lissios and, you know, the, the, Linfield Hines, I mean, really big leaders that can speak hard truth and, and aren't, aren't going to shrink back from that. I like those guys in my, in my corner. So. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, Mark, I'm, I'm really glad that you qualified that because I was wondering if I was in the dumb as the rocks category with the guys that... <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, was, I was looking for a little clarity there. No, I mean, but you know, there's sometimes where the people are thinking Job's case aren't being malicious. They're not, I don't, I don't sense that since they're just, you know, they're just off base and, uh, and they're collectively off base, which makes it even worse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think and, I can and, count my friends on one hand, like truly that's is probably less than five that I actually have in a really tight circle to allow them to speak into my life like that. It's very small. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I was wondering about, Mark, and maybe it ties into that first question a little bit is, you know, the, these accusations where, where they're talking about, you know, Job, you know, sent people away, you know, didn't give them food, didn't give them water. Were those things really, I mean, were those things that they saw or are they speculating as to why? Because he, he's making, the accusation is, Job, I, it's, it, in my opinion, it's like, I saw you do this. I saw you send people away. Right. And, and, mm -hmm. and what I, what I uh, gleaned this morning as I was looking at some commentaries is that's one of the reasons why they said these guys are conspiring. Because I think you get, you get in a circle and you, you're, you're, you know, you're talking amongst yourselves about somebody else. It's like you start to conjure up. You know, what do you think? You know what? I kind of think I've seen that. Or, you know, I, you know there, there's something that smacks true about this accusation. I mean, he could have probably, he could have probably done more for the poor, you know. And, uh, and you know, there, and that's, a, that's an interesting accusation in and of itself because uh, it doesn't really matter how much you do for the poor. There's, there's not enough that you can do for the poor to not have there be poor. You know, and it, I mean, the Bible even says, Christ said, there will always be the poor amongst you, right? And so there's, uh, there's not an end to the, to the parade of assistance that could be offered. And so there, there's, it's an accusation that, that may or may not have been true, but there's never a way to defend it because you can always point to poor people around him and say, you, you didn't solve it. You didn't, you didn't do enough. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, some of these accusations ring of truth, there's a ring of, you know, there's a, a it smacks of, of being right, but we know it's not right because God has declared it not right. You know? What truth did, uh, did his speech contain though? I mean, obviously there was the, the truth is, you know, important because there, there is that, that undercurrent of, there's some things that he said that are, are generally true of, of People that are, you know, not caring for widows, not caring for the poor. What else did you guys see? Danielle, I'll let you go. Let me go. Well, lots of things are <laughs> wrong with that. <laughs> um, I think too is like um, the not caring for people is one of the things. I mean, maybe that that is a true because that's kind of like I think for us as well too. Sometimes I mean, maybe our friends may see some things about us that we don't see and 
I I, th- I think that's kind of where these guys were going to. I mean, maybe they were kind of on base about some things too, but it's always leads back to that communication part. How well do you know this person that you're talking about? You really need to know them before you're saying something like that to accuse them of something because you don't want an accusation to come back going, oh, I was wrong about that. I probably yeah. shouldn't have said that out loud like that. You know, I love, I love that, uh, that some of the things yeah. that, they, that they said that were that's true. A, they, that's you know, a hard one. You know, they talk, about, they talk about God's forgiveness. They talk about God's, you know. So the, the thing that I love about, uh, about the truth that's being told is the nature of God is one of forgiveness. The nature of God is one that if people repent, that he redeems, he come, brings them back, that, that he's faithful in the midst of unfaithfulness. And so, you know, I think some of that stuff, that, that they they kind of look at is is really powerful. I like that there's the the melting of like silver like drop like you know he strips away and then strips away and strips mm-hmm. away and, and the heat of of, of God's uh, presence in our life can can really serve to purify and refine us. I like some of those those truth nuggets are part of it. And one of the things that I was thinking about and I didn't I didn't read this so much as I just wondered about it uh, is I wonder if some of the accusations come out of their own insecurities or maybe a, something that they see in their lives that they're not doing that they that happens so often that uh, you know, you'll, you'll hear somebody that is railing against some sort of sin only to discover sometime later that they've been struggling with that very sin. And, uh, and that yeah. often what you, what you see as most offensive in someone else is a reflection of what is in your own life you're having a hard time admitting uh, or dealing with. And so as even these accusations are coming, I wonder if, uh, if some of those accusations might not be their issue and not Job's issue. Yeah. I know when I talk to, uh, um, if I'm talking to someone or giving them advice about something, God will put an instant check in my spirit. Like, that that's something that I know that I might be wrestling with. And it, it is a very uncomfortable feeling when God does that to me, because then it lets me know that if I'm addressing something in someone else's life, that that same thing, it's like a prick on me instantly that it's something that I need to address. So I usually try not to instruct or give advice in something that if I know I get that check right away, I, I cannot, I said, and I'll have to tell someone, I can't give you that same advice that I'm not going to give for myself because I'm feeling like I should not tell you that because I need to deal with that as well too. So I'm always led in the, with the Holy Spirit to not say something when I know that that is giving me a check in my spirit. It is an awful feeling when God does that, but at the same time, it's a good thing because it's, it's him telling me, hey, watch what you saying you hey you you got something going on with you that you're about to say something to somebody else's life don't don't do that and i get it instantly i don't mess around with that one yeah i think pete's uh you know that you know when you're when you're pointing a finger at someone you got you got some fingers pointing back at yourself so Mm -hmm. yeah you know you might want to be might want to be careful about that story i think that's a it's a really good observation uh i think it's it's important when is it proper for a righteous or innocent person to rejoice at the destruction of his or her enemy feels like there feels like Jenny's Jen, Jenny puts our questions together for us. And I feel like she's she's trying to get some sneaky questions in here that get us in trouble. So tread softly. No, I'll, I'll answer it. I can answer that one. It's right. never right. To be right. <laughs> I think that's the right answer. Never. I think, okay, I but I have. The example I have is I had an opportunity, and this is how I knew that I actually had forgiven this person, to, that this person had done me wrong and has done so for years. And I just was like, God, I just, can I just like run her over with a bus? But I actually was able to see her. And actually in that moment when I saw her, and then I saw her with the perspective how God sees it, I really felt bad for her with all the stuff that I see happening to her. And I just went, Lord, all I could say was, Lord, just be merciful to her. And that's how I knew that God had changed my heart about an enemy and not to see them as to, I don't want nobody hurt. 
but I'm not going to say justice is not deserved. It is. And that's for you. You're going to have to get that. But it's not for me to wallow in, in your misery. I should not be doing that. That is not it. I have to have still that heart of compassion, even when God's justice is being served to someone that whatever they might deserve, I should never be like, yes, you got what you deserve. No, God don't want that for us. No. Well, I think it's also an indication I, for the people that I've held resentments towards in my in my life and over the course of time. It it it's interesting how resentments are are you know it's a uh, it's a poison that is destroying the work of God in me mm -hmm. more than impacting they, they they probably have long forgotten or given up you know thinking about you know any part of my storyline and so my holding a resentment. Only, only har that harboring resentment only hurts me. So, when I when I come to a place where I can actually be free of that and and wish good for someone that has wronged me, there is a freedom and a, mm -hmm. a, a life that, that gets brought into my world, and, and I want I want more of that. I don't, you know, why would I allow them to continue to injure me? Mm -hmm. Now that the, the whatever whatever caused me to feel resentful in the first place. Why would I continue to give that power to them to continue to wound or hurt me into my future? It's just. Yep. Mm -hmm. Especially when uh, God has spoken but, life over uh, us. We, we harbor sometimes, we hang on. Yeah, right. We get to inherit something that's incredible and, and, uh, and the eternity that we have in front of us and the life that we get now and the spirits and embedment into our hearts. It's like, what, what do I? It's it, what do I, why would I be upset about a small debt when I've been given the treasures of the kingdom? And that, by the way, is, a, is an idea that I think we could spend a lot of time meditating on. But, you know, when you've been adopted into the family of God, you, you've been made an heir. You've been made a joint heir. You've been made mm -hmm. uh, a son and a daughter. Uh, and and that, that idea of, of you now have all of what the king has, and yet you're going to be upset about the fact that you've been owed some small debt by somebody. It just, um, you know, that's it. That's a powerful image. If you stop and really meditate on it, isn't it? I mean, like someone owes you $10 and you've been, you just have got awarded the, the lottery and now you're going to be worried about that $10. Why did Job long for an explanation of his suffering? This one, I think, I mean, I think I get this. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that strikes me uh, about Job is that, you know, he seems really conscientious, um, really wanting to do the right thing. And that, you know, part of this, you know, a part of it, I wonder, is part of his asking, you know, why? Is it because, you know, deep down, he would want to correct? I mean, he, he's, he's searching and say, okay, what? what have I done wrong? And is, is, is anything that I have done wrong contributing to this? Is there anything that I need to do to be made right? But as he searches himself, he's not coming up with it. That's why he's looking for the explanation. Where did I, where did I go wrong here? And what do I need to do to fix it? Well, and there's a sincerity in, in Job as well, too. I know, too, like a lot of times in my own life, if I'm going through something, and especially if I know I didn't do anything and if I didn't do anything, that's great. But if I'm, if things are happening, like definitely during spiritual warfare times, when stuff like that happens, like this morning, getting on here, I'm like, God, really? I have done this every morning. I get, I do this every morning. I open it up faithfully. And now today to be a pet, I can't even log into any of my stuff. This don't make no sense. What's the, I don't get this, but I understand why God does some of these things. I mean, the fruit that's in us, he uses things in our lives also to test us too. So I think that definitely, you know, from the very beginning when God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Well, God wouldn't have said that if he didn't already know that Job was going to go through a whole gamut of questions and getting closer to God, asking him, I mean, all these questions we ask, we get closer to God by asking him questions. We move forward to this. He knew Job from the very beginning for all of this to 
I, Joe's going to ask me why he's suffering. He's going to know what this is about because he's going to move press in closer to me so he can find out these answers. It may not be what he's looking for, but he's going to come to me regardless. I, I love that about God to, to put us in that place where he knows that he's going to squeeze that fruit out of us too to get what he what he's getting out of us to to see where we're at. And I think that's where Job was too. He was like, I want to know God, what is going on? So you got to press in more in order to find out. Well, what's interesting about what you just said is, I mean, our brains are really hardwired to find, find answers to questions. And one of the things that I think is the difference between someone who's living a victorious life and someone who's living a self-sabotaging life is the nature of the questions with which they ask. Mm -hmm. uh, if they learn to ask themselves great questions, uh, their minds go to work to find the answers to those questions. So uh, God search me and, 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 and know me and, and show me our, our great questions. Uh, those are good questions. But, you know, I think a lot of times we've, we've learned to ask self-sabotaging questions like, why are you so dumb? Or why are you not mm -hmm. worthwhile? Or why are you not more beautiful? Or why can't you ever win? Or why can't you? And your brain immediately goes to work to try to prove and answer all those questions. Rather, how could I get better at this? How can I see this as an opportunity? How can I move forward? What would it take to really thrive today? How could I be more successful at that idea? How could I navigate this you know, in a, in a different fashion? Our brains mm -hmm. automatically immediately go to work to find the answers to those kinds of questions. And, and our brains work for us, but we, we send them on tasks, pools, errands, <laughs> that uh, wind up causing us to be, uh, you know, living half of the life that I think God had meant for us to, to live. So, yeah. but I, I like what you said, Todd, too, about the, I think he maybe wanted to know, it's like, is there something here that I should own? Well, and when you, say? well, I was just going to say when you, you know, you use that, you know, the, you know, so there's questions. Why tends to get at, at um, you know, some reason that this is happening. But the other two questions, you know, what and how, you know, if, if we can train ourselves to answer to your point, how do I resolve this? How do I work through this? Or what can I gain or what can I do now as opposed to why? Because oftentimes why leads to some sort of an excuse or maybe some kind of blaming when if a question is asked to your point, how do I do this? What do I need to do? It changes completely I think how that affects you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Absolutely. Why do you why do you think God allows some evil to go unpunished and some suffering to go unexplained? And I, I got to, nothing. I got nothing. I have to. I got to press into God a lot <laughs> for questions like that because um, I ask that all the time. Like. Like, Lord, how long are you going to let this happen like this? How long will you let our world just go crazy or just many different things? Or how come nothing happens to them and stuff always happens to me? But um, the one thing sometimes I get from God is that, Tanya, this is why life really isn't fair. But if you're looking at me, don't worry about all the other stuff that's around you. You don't mm -hmm. need to worry about how I may not um, punish someone or how something is because who's sovereign here it's it's me i'm in control of everything so i get you and i love you and thank you for the questions because you're my daughter but i i got this just trust me and just just trust me and that's hard to like what do you mean just trust you just just trust you when you didn't answer my question but as a parent <laughs> when our kids come to us for stuff and we're like okay, trust me, you're, you're going to thank me for this later. I don't have an explanation for you right now or whatever it might be, but you know that I love you, right? And my kids, yeah. when I ask some questions, they're like, yeah, mom. Okay, so I'm just asking you to trust me here. I can't give you an answer for something or whatever it might be, but I just need you to do this. Can you trust me? And my sons are like, yeah, but I don't want to. <laughs> I say that all the time. So I think that's when I press into God a lot more for those things when I don't understand what he's doing mm -hmm. and then i have to ultimately i gotta trust him and not question his sovereignty i want to but i try to really not because i really trust what he does even if i don't understand and i'm okay with that it's hard but i'm okay with that so todd you've been to 
Honduras and worked in the Manuelito project. Uh, I was there, I think, five or six years ago. I've been there a number of times, but five or six years ago when I was there, I was talking to one of the young ladies who was uh, staying there, and uh, and she was asking me questions about America, and uh, and. Uh, and we were working through an interpreter and, uh, and the, in <laughs> the interpreter started laughing at one point and, uh, and said, well, she's got a really interesting question. She said her father had, had went to America and she sometimes is able to talk with them. And she had asked her dad what was most surprising about being in America. And he said, the most surprising thing is that they complain about stuff here. <laughs> Which I thought was just a really funny way of thinking about it. It's like, he got here, you know, and, and in their mind, the streets are paved with gold and still we complain about stuff. You That's know? right. It's like, mm -hmm. I think a lot of times, uh, the reality is that, you know, um, you know we, don't, we don't often recognize it's like when we think, why are things unfair? Uh, we don't take into consideration that maybe that's not the right question for us in light of what's going on in the world. <laughs> and so, Todd, pray us out today. I will. God, thank you uh, again for today. Thank you for Tanya. Uh, what a joy to have her join us today with, with her energy and her insights. She is such a blessing, Lord, and I'm so grateful for her and um, her willingness to participate in this. And so I thank you for that. And, and for all the others that, um, you know, throughout the chat, Father, there's just some wonderful insights. And I'm so grateful for everyone who chooses to participate with this on a daily basis. It's just so rich. And Lord, I, I know that uh, I'm guilty of complaining. In fact, as Mark said, that I'm, I'm amazed at the things that I will gripe about. Mm -hmm. truly amazed and, and father i just pray that, that today as as we go forth that we would understand that each and every one of us because of where we live we are blessed and i know that we've got frustrations and and things that are causing us anxiety but lord we can rely on you we can lean to you uh, thank you so much that you really do have things in control and Lord, I pray that we would continue to seek after you and ask questions of you, knowing that sometimes we're going to get the answers and maybe sometimes the answers, we're just going to have to wait. But Father, whatever it happens to be today, I just ask that you would bless each and every person here, uh, bless them as they go forward into this day. And, and again, I ask that each one of us could be a blessing to someone else today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Amen. God bless you guys. You know, it is amazing how important starting my day in the Word of God is and how rich it's been starting my day in the Word of God with you. Thanks for being here. Hope you do really have a great day and look forward to seeing you tomorrow. See you, Bye, Thanks, guys. Tanya. You're welcome.